We are incredibly grateful to Ruth Orda, who is not able to be with us today, for her inspiration and guidance for today's land acknowledgement. And so as we begin our celebration, we take a moment to acknowledge that the land where we live and worship in this place is stolen land. We are on the unceded lands of the ones we know today as the Ohlone people. Ohlone territory spans from San Francisco east towards Oakland and south towards Monterey. There are eight language dialects within this territory, and historically, there are over 60 village sites. We are on Yalamu land, and the first language spoken on these lands is Ramatush. We recognize and honor the original stewards of this land and pay respect to elders both past and present. Not only are we on Ohlone land, but Ohlone are living here today, still a part of this community. We acknowledge the historic violence and genocide against indigenous siblings and ancestors, as well as the harm that the US government continues to perpetuate. We pray that this church's continued work towards justice and the necessary cessation and dismantling of the colonial structures we continue to inhabit. We offer thanks for being able to worship and to live here. And we encourage all of us to find out more about the lands upon which we live and to find concrete ways to make reparations to the original stewards of these places and their descendants. And now I ask you to please stand and face the font as we continue our celebration.
creates and calls, renews and liberates, gathers and animates. Amen. Amen. Megan Marie, in the waters of baptism, you were embraced by this one, sealed, anointed, and named beloved. You are now called to serve a bishop among us in the church. Beloved in Christ, though many were made one siblings together, in Christ we know generosity, grace, and forgiveness. In Christ we find strength for our proclamation of the gospel and our work of justice within the world. Thanks be to God. Praise and thanksgiving be to you, O God, for the waters you provide for the earth, for the snow and the dew, for oceans and wells, for the rain that nourishes all of creation, for the waters of the San Francisco Bay. We praise you, O God, for water. We praise you, O God, for water. For the waters of the Sacramento River, we praise you, O God, for water. We praise you, O God, for water. For the waters of Lake Tahoe, Tahoe, we praise you, O God, for water. We praise you, O God, for water. For the waters of the Garcia River, we praise you, O God, for water. We praise you, O God, for water. Blessing and glory be to you, O God, for your word that flows with life-giving waters. For the story of the well that sustained Hagar and Ishmael in the desert. For the water by the road where the Ethiopian eunuch was declared in your promise, drenched in your promise. For the memory of the Jordan that immersed your beloved in our sorrows for the living rivers that flow from the cross, for the reconciling waters of baptism. We praise you, O God, for water and the word. We bless you, O God, for water and the word. Pour out upon us again the spirit of our baptism. Our roots are dry. Shower us with blessing. Our fruits need moisture. Renew us for vibrant growth. Bathe us in your unconditional loving kindness. Refresh us for the work of justice and peace. We beg you, O God, for water and the Spirit. We beg you, O God, for water and the Spirit. You, O God, parent, child, and holy breath, you are the water we crave. You, O God, rain, estuary, and sea, you are life for us all, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Trusting God, to shower all creation with life-giving waters, we use these ancient words to articulate the mystery of faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and that is unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him the
the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, through your beloved Son, Jesus the Christ, you gave the holy apostles many gifts and commanded them to feed your flock. Inspire all pastors to proclaim your word diligently and your people to receive it willingly, that finally we may receive the crown of eternal glory through our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. during this time. Good afternoon. I'm Mark Andrus, the Episcopal Bishop of the Diocese of California, which is the Episcopal Church in the Bay Area. It is an honor and a pleasure for me, along with the Most Reverend Michael Bruce Curry, Presiding Bishop of the Episcopal Church, the people of the Diocese of California, and the people, clergy, and staff of Grace Cathedral to welcome Bishop Megan Rohr for her installation as the fifth bishop of the Sierra Pacific Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. We are delighted to have this historic and blessed moment to be in Grace Cathedral, which is a living center of prayer and embodied justice. I'm also delighted to welcome with gratitude all of you who have come to attend Bishop Megan's installation, whether here in person or the many more who are able to join us through live streaming. We're so grateful for the technology that even those, this great, uh, terrible pandemic has limited our lives and taken lives, yet we have found ways to be together. We are so glad all of you are here. Particularly, I wish to recognize and greet our distinguished guests, ELCA Presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton, ELCA Bishops Dorothy Hutterer, David Mullen, Kristen Quempel, James Gonia, Andy Taylor, and Mark Homerud. I welcome the Episcopal Bishop of Northern California, Megan Traquer, my uh, sister and neighbor. I welcome San Francisco supervisors, Rafael Mandelman, Matt Haney, Myrna Melgar. I welcome State Senator Scott Weiner. I welcome and honor San Francisco Police Chief Bill Scott and Fire Chief Janine Nicholson and San Francisco Mayor London Breed's representative Malia Cohen. I also am honored that our Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis is here with us today. It is our joy and our commitment in the Episcopal Church and in this diocese to seek always to make known what we call the beloved community, which is the community formed by overflowing love whose qualities are justice and peace. Today, the installation of a Lutheran bishop in an Episcopal cathedral is a showing forth of the beloved community. It was 21 years ago that our two denominations declared themselves to be in full communion. We maintain our diversity of expression and yet proclaim at all times our essential oneness in Christ. It is 20 years ago today that our nation, nation suffered a great wound in the 9-11 strike. On that day, without any planning from the cathedral, 5,000 5, people from San Francisco came and gathered here, inside and on the steps of Grace Cathedral. It is a place of safety, a place of strength and courage, and a place of welcome. We continue to commit ourselves to that with 
our partners, the ELCA. Bishop Megan, along with words of welcome, you and the good people of the Sierra Pacific Synod will continue to have our partnership in prayer and ministry. And for you and your family, our friendship this day and in the years ahead. The beloved community is justice and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit and open in us the gates of our hearts. Amen. Now I'm doing it. Bishop Roar, I had this fear that I would be up here, <laughs> which diminished when I saw the microphone down there, and then was exacerbated when I was led up here. It's a lot for a Jewish kid. I, I'm Raphael Mandelman. I'm uh, the gay on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Uh, just got a little, a little air punch from our queer fire chief down there, Janine Nicholson. And our queer Democratic Party chair is here, Honey Mahogany. Um, I do think, I mean, I am overwhelmed by this uh, amazing building every time I come here. Um, and I think that uh, for those of you who may, who may have seen the Time Out, uh, report this week that San Francisco is the best city in the world. Um, folks have been debating that. But I think if San Francisco is the best city in the United States, it is in part um, because of the ability to have gatherings like this, where you have an agnostic, gay, Jewish, local elected official speaking to a gathering of Episcopalians and Lutherans and friends united in this amazing building that has done so much, honored so many, and advanced so much justice in the world with the quilt, uh, panels from the quilt hanging above us. It's a very San Francisco moment, in entirely appropriate for Bishop Rohr, um, and it is a thrill, a great thrill to be here. Now, I would be here even if we weren't making history today because Bishop Rohr is a friend um, and an extraordinary person. Uh, I think we've probably known each other for going on a decade now, I'm guessing. I, I first met uh, Bishop Rohr back when they were coordinating um, breakfast at St. Francis Lutheran uh, every Sunday morning for unhoused folks and other, other folks who just didn't have access to food. And I was a volunteer in that effort, got to know uh, uh, Megan in that capacity, and then followed uh, their progress um, uh, at Grace Lutheran. Sometimes our paths would cross at community events. And then over the last several years, um, I've been, uh, I think San Francisco has been blessed um, to, have, uh, to have Bishop Rohr with the San Francisco Police Department um, leading the community chaplaincy um, efforts at a time when that has, as you all know, been so terribly challenging and difficult. Um, the queer community, like many other communities, has a challenging relationship histori historically with police in general. And I think that it is so great um, that uh, Bishop Rohr decided to go into the department and help build uh, relationships and bring healing, uh, which is so necessary and important. So I, um, I, wanna, I wanna thank you for that. So even you know, for all those reasons, I would be here. But of course we are making history 
today. And I was, and uh, Bishop Andrus um, mentioned the other history of this day, uh, which is 9-11. Um, and I, I think I started, I started the day at uh, 6.45 this morning at a memorial, um, and I'm a little tired because of that. But, um, but it's an emotional thing. Um, if you're like me and you were, most of you I'm guessing are at least, you know, contemporaries, were, were, were sentient uh, when, when that horrible tragedy happened. It was incredibly emotional. I was a wreck for at least a week, lots of crying, lots of tears throughout this country. And as we think back on that day, I've been thinking, and I think some of you have probably been thinking, about not just the tragedy and death of that day, but the tragedy and death that it brought over the next 20 years, and the ways in which this country pursued, acted out of fear in ways that caused not just thousands of deaths, but hundreds of thousands of deaths, and the loss of trillions of dollars. Um, and that also makes this um, a rough day. But I learned, as I was learning about, um, learning about uh, Bishop Rohr and this, and this um, ceremony, that this is also a feast day uh, for what, for I guess the first transgender saint, um, uh, Saint Theodora Theodorus. Bishop Rohr, I, we all know, is going to be the first transgender bishop of a mainline, or is the first transgender bishop of a mainline Christian denomination in the United States. And for all the fear and sadness and tragedy of the last 20 years, it is um, undeniable that there has been light uh, in changing social notions and laws within institutions, religious, secular, throughout this country and throughout the world. Um, so it brings me a lot of hope and joy to be able to celebrate history of another kind um, this day. I want to thank the Lutheran Church for making these, for this evolution that I read some more about in the notes. Um, and I want to thank uh, Bishop Rohr. I, I think that this quote is so um, relevant to, the two, to these twin histories of this day. It's in the front of your program, and, and someone I'm sure will talk about it, but I was so struck. Lutherans are called to do the best we can to live into grace rather than living into fear. Um, and this Jew is uh, deeply admiring of that sentiment. So congratulations, Bishop Rohr. A reading from the prophet For thus says Sovereign God. I myself will search for my sheep. I will seek them out, as shepherds seek out their flocks when their flocks are scattered in every direction. So I will search for my sheep and rescue them, no matter where they scatter on the day of full clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the countries and bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by streams and wherever there is a settlement. I will feed them on good pastures land, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing ground. I myself will tend my flock and have it lie down Thus says, says sovereign, sovereign God. God. I will seek out the lost. I will return. I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. 
and I will watch over the Fed and the sleek. I will be, be a, a true, true shepherd, shepherd to, them. to them. Therefore, Therefore thus, thus says, says God, God to, to you. you. I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. For you show beside the weak with flank and shoulder. You butt them with your horns until they are scattered in every direction. I will save my flock and they will be ravaged no longer. I will judge between one sheep and another. I will set up over them one shepherd to care for them, my servant David. He will care for them and be their shepherd. And I, God, will, will be their God. God. And my, and my servant, servant David, David will be their leader. leader. I, I, God, have spoken. spoken. I will make a covenant of peace with my sheep and banish wild animals from the land so that my people can live in the open pastures and sleep safely in the forest. I will bless them and the region surrounding my hill. I will send down seasonal rains, showers, and blessings. The trees of the field will yield their fruit, and the earth will yield its crop. The people will be secure in their land. And when I break the bars of their yoke and rescue them from the hands of the enslavers, they, they will, will know no that I am God. They will no longer be plundered by the nations, nor will the wild animals devour them. They will live secure, free from terror. I will provide for them a land renowned for its crops, and they will never again be victimized by famine in the land, nor bear the scorn of the nation. Then they will know that I, I God, God, and their God. their God, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, Say, says Sovereign God. God. You are my sheep, the flock that I tend, and, and I am, am your God, 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 says Sovereign God. God. Word of God, word of life.
a reading from the book of Acts. An angel of God spoke to Philip and said, be ready to set out at noon along the road that goes to Gaza, the desert road. So Philip began his journey. It happened that an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official in charge of the entire treasury of Candace, the ruler of Ethiopia, had come to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage and was returning home. He was sitting in his carriage and reading the prophet Isaiah. The spirit said to Philip, go up and meet the carriage. When Philip ran up, he heard the eunuch reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? How can I, the eunuch replied, unless someone explains it to me. With that, he invited Philip to get in the carriage with him. This was the passage of scripture being read. You are like a sheep being led to slaughter. You are like a lamb that is mute in front of its shearers. Like them, you never open your mouth. You have been humiliated and have no one to defend you. Who will ever talk about your descendants since your life on earth has been cut short? The eunuch said to Philip, tell me if you will, about whom the prophet is talking, himself or someone else? So Philip proceeded to explain the good news about Jesus to him. Further along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there is some water right there. Is there anything to keep me from being baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop. Then Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the spirit of God snatched Philip away. The eunuch didn't see him anymore and went on his way rejoicing. Philip found himself at Hashdad next, and he went about proclaiming the good news in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
Returning to the synagogue, Jesus met someone who had a withered hand. Now the religious authorities were watching to see if Jesus would heal the, the individual on the Sabbath day. As they were hoping for some evidence to use against Jesus, he said to the afflicted one, stand and come up front. Then he turned to them and said, is it permitted to do a good deed on the Sabbath? or an evil one to preserve life or to destroy it. At this they remained silent. Jesus looked around at them with anger, for he was deeply grieved that they had closed their hearts so. Then Jesus said to the person, stretch out your hand. The other did so, and the hand was perfectly restored. The Pharisees went out at once and began to plot with the Herodians, discussing how to destroy Jesus. Word of promise and new life. Grace to you in Grace Cathedral. From the creator of us all, and for Jesus, our Lord and sibling. Many thanks to Bishop Andrus and Dean Young and all the community of Grace Cathedral who have opened their doors and arms and hearts to us. Their hospitality has been remarkable. And I think many of us remember on that day 20 years ago how this cathedral, this place, became a house of prayer for all nations. It's a marvelous, marvelous occasion to be here. This is the first of seven new bishops in the ELCA who will be installed and, and taking up their new ministry, their new call. So here we are with the first one. And as I remarked to uh, Bishop Rohr, they are probably used to being first. <laughs> but not last. And they chose these powerful, powerful readings for today. And I believe that even in your bulletins, you have footnotes. This is the first time I've had an installation bulletin with footnotes. So I urge you to read those, not now, maybe later. But. <laughs> There's something that, many things that tie these, these readings together that might not be immediately evident. I mean, the, from Ezekiel, uh, the, the, the prophet of, I don't know what, hyperbolic symbolism, we have that story. The story of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts and Philip with the Greek name showing up to baptize the first person baptized after the resurrection of Jesus. And then the story of Jesus who dares to push the limits to trans 
when he shows up at the synagogue and provides healing. All of these, I think, show people who are, are on the margins, the people of Israel in, in, in exile. It shows, in fact, the, the, the faithlessness of their leaders, which is a cautionary tale to those of us who are dressed like me, that we are to be faithful. It's a, it's a story of the fragility and the vulnerability of God's people who must deci decide that they will, they will find their life by depending upon this creator instead of taking things into their own hands. It's a story of, of, of being powerless in many cases. The story of the Ethiopian eunuch from Acts 2, um, Acts, uh, the second lesson is I'm sure familiar to many of us whom um, one of our colleagues used to refer to us as church geeks because we would know the story right away. We're so used to it that the, the surprising uh, thing that's happening that this man who would have been marginalized, he was a Gentile in Jewish territory, he was, he was a eunuch in a place where many times eunuchs were not considered fully human, and to have this Greek Jewish disciple come and explain scripture to him. Now, I hope those of you um, who are not part of the faith don't, don't just listen to that one part that the Ethiopian was listening to, which is really kind of, it's kind of grim. I don't know why he couldn't have been looking at, you know, Isaiah, you know, for unto us a child is born, a son is given. But no, speaking specifically and, and clearly in there, and Philip giving the explanation that this is how God chooses to be God for us. Not a far off, but one who is silent before accusers, but not powerless. One who seems to be weak, but in that weakness brings about true strength and salvation and joy and freedom. And then, the cor the, of course, the story about the man with the withered hand. You needed your hands to work in those days. I mean, we need some digits in order to operate our uh, personal handheld devices and work on our Surface Pros, but you needed your hands to work in the society then. And also, too often, and this is not just related or relegated to those days, people see a physical difference or disability as divine judgment. All of these people are waiting and yearning for the wholeness that God along, alone can bring. Now, I want us to pay particular attention to the beginning of that story in Acts, where it says that Philip and this eunuch were walking around the wilderness road. Think of those times when the people of God have found themselves in the wilderness. Think of those times when wandering without food or water, needing to be completely dependent upon the grace and mercy of God to provide the very means of life where they're wandering in this wilderness. Think of Jesus in the wilderness being tempted, being tempted over and over again. I'll make a short aside here. Um, so for those listening who have not yet been vaccinated, and you say we should just depend upon God, and when the devil said to Jesus, throw yourself down, because God will give you angels lest you dash your foot against the rock, Jesus said, don't tempt the Lord your God. So go get your vaccination right now. <laughs> Wilderness is often experienced as a marginalized place or a liminal space where the separation between our human existence and the divine becomes very, very thin. These thin places, these liminal places, we find these often in our lives, whether we're in a desert or in a beautiful cathedral like this, where we find ourselves on the margins, where we are balanced between hope and despair, between life and death, between brokenness and wholeness. We find ourselves in these places. And it is interesting that over and over and over again in Scripture, amongst the mystics, in our own lives and experiences, that when we find ourselves in this liminal space where we are not in charge anymore and must turn and welcome 
the grace of God that God is there. And not because we've summoned God, but because God is already present. So in this liminal space where, where, where the people of Israel were wondering how would they ever find reconciliation, restoration to their land, where, where this, 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 this man with the withered hand, how would ever he find wholeness in that liminal space? This, this place where the, where the Ethiopian uh, um, authority, given a lot of authority, in fact, and Philip are wandering in this wilderness, it turns out God is showing up. Maybe it turns out we are opening our eyes and hearts and minds and lives to God's presence, which has always been there. There's a lot of either or in our church. Well, the Episcopal Church, too. I'm not going to let you off the hook. <laughs> Certainly in our communities and in our country and in the world, it has to be one thing or the other, either or. But the great miracle of God and the way God chooses to be God for us is that God opens up more than either or. There's both and. Now, Lutherans, we love paradox, so we say there's, we're saint and sinner, there's law and gospel, we're bound and free. We don't always believe that, but at least we can articulate that sort of thing. <laughs> but in order to make sense of the world, and I think, sadly, over the past several recent years, we've been asked to choose either or and are no longer to see both and. Neither are we able to see how God shows up in those liminal places, if you think about it. Jesus, and I won't make you quote the catechism right now, however, we understand Jesus to be fully divine, but also fully human, born of Mary. That's not an either or. That's a transition, a transitional place, a, a place where God enters in. And we also understand that for us, God's greatest act of beauty was on the cross. Jesus was either dead or not. That's what the Romans hoped to make sure would happen. They put guards to make sure that that would be the case. And the people who are supposed to make sure that the dead say dead, we're not very successful. But this instrument of torture and humiliation, that should just have ended the whole story. But instead, this, this liminal, this both and, where God in the presence of a suffering Messiah was both and was able to work out our transition from hopelessly broken sinners to the redeemed, the redeemed of God. Now, um, we're here, and I can see the camera back there, and so this is being broadcast all over the world. Interestingly enough, Lutherans in Ethiopia are probably watching us, even as we're talking about the story of the Ethiopian. But what caught my eye, really, was that, that phrase, in the gospel according to Mark, when it talks about those who opposed Jesus and said they watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath. They're watching us. They're watching this synod. They're watching this bishop. They're watching this church to see what we are going to do. What is this about? Now, I don't know about you, Bishop Rohr, but I didn't go into this line of work because I thought it would be a path to fame and fortune. Certainly not the fortune part. <laughs> and resisted it. I'm a music education major. I was supposed to be a band director. <laughs> There's a band director. Very good. Someone just says I have a larger band now, um, which is helpful. And I don't think that you went into ministry to ordain word and sacrament ministry and allowed yourself to be open to this call because you were looking forward to having your life under a microscope or having people ask the question, wait for it, Bishop, how will you get more youth and young adults in the church?
They went into this, I, under, I believe, because they felt the irresistible call of God. They felt the irresistible call of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news that's embodied, incarnate in the world, not just as a theory or a great teacher, but Jesus healing this man on the Sabbath, Jesus stripped and humiliated and dying on the cross, Jesus raised from the dead, not a theory, but this is the good news, and it's the good news for all of us, everyone, all people, all people. That's what we're doing here. We're preaching the gospel in its purity and administering the sacraments according to the gospel. We are here because we believe that the word of God transforms life, and we also believe that God is not absent and that Jesus by the Spirit is with us here and everywhere I go. Your bishop has embodied that in their ministry all the way up until this point and will continue to embody that. Your bishop sleeps on the streets with those who have no homes. Your bishop feeds those who are hungry just as the synod does, just as this diocese does, just as we all do. And we can do this because we've been set free by Jesus Christ so we can serve the neighbor. This bishop is sometimes a paradox themselves. This bishop, one would automatically consider to be some sort of crazy radical person. But how do we, when we try to sort into either or, square that with the fact that they are a chaplain for the San Francisco Police Department? And thank you to the members of the police department and the fire department who are here celebrating with us today. This bishop walks not only with families in trauma, but when these first responders uh, respond to a, a traumatic incident where often people are killed and these responders need to stay with these people until their families come, stay with the bodies of those who have died, this chaplain, your bishop, stands with them and prays with them. And I'm happy to say, as I've heard today, that at PLT, Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary, and uh, Dr. Pickett is here, they are starting a degree program in how to respond to trauma, especially with our first responders. As we've heard many times today, it is the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And there's an interesting story about that that I heard from our former bishop in Metro New York. He said on that day that the, the chaplain to the fire department rushed down to lower Manhattan as the firefighters were mustering. And the chaplain prayed with these firefighters and anointed them with oil on their foreheads. And then the chaplains do what our first responders do. They didn't run away, they ran into, into danger. And the people who made it out of those towers said they could see the crosses shining on the foreheads of the firefighters. This is the work that your bishop carries out. And I wonder if we have any first responders in the assembly. Could you stand? Thank you. So people are watching. What does this installation mean? What is it about this bishop? What on earth was a Sierra Pacific Synod thinking? Though I think sometimes we say to God, what, what were you thinking? But here we are. If you're watching, continue to watch us. Because you're going to see a grace-filled, gospel-preaching, Jesus-loving servant of the word serving everyone, all people, all people. You're going you're gonna to see someone in a synod being transformed in order to invite people into the complete, the infinite, and the intimate love of God. And this love is what gives us the freedom now to be in service to the neighbor, not so that we can somehow earn our way into heaven. We're not doing that to use people. No, we are free to serve the neighbor, and that's what you're going to see. If you want to see what they're going to do, that's what they're going to do. You want to see what the synod is going to do and what we hope to be called to do? 
We are continuing and will continue to work for those on the margins. We will be aware of those in liminal spaces, including ourselves. And we do this not by ourselves, we understand that. We do it surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And we do it by a God who was not either or, but both and, divine and human, seemingly weak, but unbelievably strong, seemingly marred and humiliated, but creating an act of indescribable beauty. I pray, Bishop Rohr, and you all better be praying for them as well. Blessings on this ministry as you continue the work that has been begun in you. And blessings on this synod and the rest of us in this church and beyond. The unity really embodied by our bishops here from not only the ELCA but the Episcopal Church. That we will understand that what we are doing is something that God continues to work in us. And that what we are doing brings life. Amen.
I present Megan Marie Rohrer, who has been elected and called by the church for installation into the office of Bishop of the Sierra Pacific Synod. A reading from John. Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. A reading from Matthew. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you guardians to feed the church of God that he obtained with the blood of his own son. A reading from 2 Timothy. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed rightly explaining the word of truth. And again, hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have learned from me and in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. To you is being given the care of the pastors, deacons, and congregations of this synod. I ask you in the presence of God and of this assembly, will you assume the office of Bishop of the Sierra Pacific Synod? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you be faithful in your office? Will you commit yourself to this new trust and responsibility in the confidence that it comes from God through the call of the church? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you carry out this ministry in accordance with the Holy Scriptures, with the confessions of the Lutheran Church, and in harmony with the constitutions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you be diligent in your study of Holy Scriptures and in your use of the means of grace? Will you love, serve, and pray for God's people, nourish them with the word and sacraments, and lead them by your own example in faithful service and holy living? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you give faithful witness in the world that God's love may be known in all that you do? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you guide, encourage, and support the ministries and the congregations of the Synod in their ministries? Will you be an advocate for the ministries of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America? And will you support this church's work with global and ecumenical partners? I will, and I ask God to help me. Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, graciously give you the strength and the compassion to perform them. Please stand. People of God, representatives of this synod, will you receive Megan Marie as a servant of God and a shepherd in the Church of Jesus Christ? Will you pray for them, help and honor them for their work's sake, and in all things strive to live together in the peace and unity of Christ? You may be seated.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks that by your Holy Spirit you sustain the Church. By the power of the Holy Spirit you call, gather, enlighten, and sanctify the whole Church. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Meg and Marie to empower and enlighten their ministry as a bishop in your church. Sustain them as a shepherd who tends the flock of Christ with love and gentleness and oversees the ministries of the church with vision and wisdom. Uphold them as a faithful steward of your holy word and life-giving sacraments and a strong sign of reconciliation among all people. Give courage and fortitude to sustain them in this ministry we ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior and Lord, through whom all glory and power and honor are yours in your holy church. Amen. Amen. The office of bishop is now committed to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good so that you may do good God's will, working in you that which is pleasing in God's sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. God of endless galaxies and microscopic realms, Creation sings your praise for ocean shores and high deserts, vineyard hills and farming valleys, scorched forests and waving redwoods. Let our lives reflect, reflect your care for great and small and give us courage to raise our voices for policy and practices that steward this world you love in justice, mercy, and tender care. For the nations of this world and the people who believe them, we pray for wisdom, mercy, and justice to flow like the rivers that fill the sea, for just and caring policies that grow from brave imagination to bold new realities, for advocacy workers who bring to awareness the needs of our communities and all those changed with keeping peace. Give them hearts for justice, equity, gentleness, and grace. God. We give you thanks for the people of this Sierra Pacific Synod, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the Lutheran World Federation, and the church around the world, from tiny babies to the eldest among us. Make us bold to bear witness to your radical and inclusive love, a love that breaks down walls and opens doors to abundant life. May our love for one another be a witness to your grace and our life together a resounding shout that you call us into community for the life of the world. Bishop Megan, as they step fully into this call of your spirit to serve your church, give them wisdom and grace, boldness and courage, imagination and love of your people. Sustain them in the weary moments and grant unexpected joy in the months and years ahead. May every visit be a witness to the presence of God in all these spaces. community we long for be a sign of your kingdom among us, for boldness to speak when we would rather stay silent, for courage to amplify the voices of those who have been continually silenced, 
and perseverance in lifting the voices of those who think they have nothing to say. Sustain our hearts when we fail. Give us courage and wisdom to work at it, even when the voices tempt us otherwise. Show us your vision of a table where all are fed and neighborhoods where no one is cast aside. God of healing, our bodies and minds are fragile these days, and we feel weary and afraid. Make your presence and healing touch unmistakable in those spaces of our lives where sickness wears us down. Strengthen the bodies of those who care for the sick that fill our hospitals and homes and spaces known only to you. We call out aloud the people we know and trust that you hold those we do not know close to your heart. God of endings and beginnings, our hearts carry the memories and our gathering bears witness to the lives of those who have come before us. They cheer us on from the cloud of witnesses and we push on in their sacred memory. Until the day we meet again, give us their courage and boldness to proclaim in every word and deed that your promise to be with us to the very end of the age is unfailing and true. God, those we have voiced and those only known to you, we trust your mercy and love, and it is in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Remember to rekindle the gift of God that is within you. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. Receive this cross and wear it as a sign of your calling to serve Christ and the people of God, and a reminder that you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Receive this mitre as a sign of the authority we place upon you as our bishop. We present this mitre to you on behalf of the Lutheran Latinx community. Receive this crozier as a sign of your vocation. May Christ the Good Shepherd uphold you and sustain you as you act in his name. Receive the Holy Scriptures as the source of your inspiration and the wellspring of gospel-centered proclamation among us. People of God, I present to you your new bishop, the Reverend Dr. Megan Rohr.
about the words of Maya Angelou lately. Then they write me down in history with their bitter twisted lies, trod me down in the very dirt, but still like dust, I rise. Rising from the past of history's shame out of the past of all the things that bring shame, I rise, I rise, I rise. We are gathered here in a historic place, in historic times. Not the first to do a hard thing as we live through all the hard things. But we rise. One of the first major non-sports gatherings in San Francisco. <laughs> as it ought to be. These quilts remind us of times when epidemics that don't yet have vaccinations fueled fear and made some people wonder if the things they proclaimed to tiny babies while sprinkling water on their head applied when they were adults. If you want to zone out for the rest of my talk, it applies to everyone. <laughs> and we here in this place, Episcopal and Presbyterian and Methodist and all of the ecumenical partners here in San Francisco and around the globe responded to the AIDS crisis, silently showing up acting up in streets, shouting with signs, demanding medications. We rise. We continue to rise. Lots of people will write stories about this. I don't know if you've seen the papers. But the real truth is that stories from so long ago that the papers have holes in them. Remind us over and over again that in the midst of fear and epidemics, even when those epidemics are poverty and mistrust of people of different types, that love can be an answer. It might take you to a cross. Three days later, though, he rose, he rose. Inspiring us to do the same, echoing that throughout time and space. Our congregations through this great Sierra Pacific Synod have responded with love and gratitude, housing refugees in their own homes, rebuilding places when fire just took it away. marching to end racism, still marching to end racism, committing to learn more, to banish racism from every speck it clings to, and then sweep the floor, and then hose the floor, and start again. You are people who rise. You got up this morning, when it was too hard for others, you put on fancy outfits. Many of you climbed about a hundred stairs. And as, as the incense rose in this space, you knew God's up to something. Not because I sit here with a bigger hat now, but because courageous people voted a new way. Behold, a new thing is happening. But because when I say, can I come visit you all the way out in Elko, they say, yes, let's have a party and an installation. My call is one, yes, to 
be up to the same messy, loving things I was up to before, as you may have noticed if you saw gum on the bottom of my shoe while I was kneeling. Probably still going to be up to some of that. But mostly, if you'll let me, and I think you will, my hope is to love you. And beyond that, to love what you love, which means when I come, I'm going to spend 20 minutes looking at your quilt squares and at the community garden and at the brand new pulpit, at the solar panels on the roof, at your children's pictures, and all of the things that inspire joy in your communities, regardless of how big, regardless of how small, regardless of how much you give, or if you don't. But give, I guess I'm supposed to say that now, right? <laughs> the good news is that we're Lutherans, right? Even if I screw it all up, God shows up. Even if you screw it all up and like it, God shows up. <laughs> so let us be people who do the best we can, the best we can. And when it gets hard, we'll rise. But the good news is, I don't have to do it alone. I got a whole front pew here of family. They all want to chat with you later. Right? Show them your picture. Yeah. They're rooting for me. But I also have a staff that will tell you I walk too quickly in public for them to follow. But they're all committed to getting all the work done. Am I right? Many of these people haven't slept in a while because they helped with all of this planning along with a big installation team. All right. And since this day is about more than just me and the work that you do will reflect on me just as much as the work I do will reflect on you, we're in this together, right? And so... On your recommendation, the following persons have been called or appointed by the Synod Council for Service on the Synodical Staff Team. Pastor Amanda Trutinsky, Pastor Hazel Salazar-Davidson, Pastor Tita Valeriano, Catherine Slaba, Steve Wright, Diana Barrios, and Pastor Bill Wong. I ask you in the presence of this assembly, Will you commit yourselves to your new trust and responsibility in the confidence that it comes from God? I will. We will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have an internal glimpse at what staff meetings look like. <laughs> it's the Zoom delay. Will you carry out this ministry to the best of your ability in accordance with the Holy Scriptures and the confessions of the Lutheran Church and in harmony with the constitutions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America? Will you pray for this community and seek to cultivate love and respect among all whom you serve? You're getting better, good job. Will you give faithful witness in the world? that God's love and justice may be known in all that you do. May God, who has inspired you to undertake these things, provide you with the generosity, strength, and compassion needed to do them. Turn it up. People of God, will you receive these members of your synodical staff team in the ways in which they have been invited to serve this church with the proclamation of the gospel of hope and liberation? Will you pray for them, help and honor them for the sake of their work, and in all things strive to live together in peace and unity of Christ?
Stand up, everyone. Let us pray. Ever-living God, strengthen and sustain Manda, Hazel, Tita, Bill, Steve, Diana, and Catherine on their journey of discipleship, that together we might love you, care for one another with grace and mercy, and serve the world with justice and compassion. Through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. People of God, join with me in welcoming these members of our synodical team. be with you always.
Let us pray. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is sure. Word and water, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Receive the gifts we bring and nourish us to proclaim your abiding love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. May God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the God Most High. Eternal God, in the abundance of your love, you have caused all things to be, from dust and spirit. You have woven our humanity. Yet we turn away from you and named upon each other. We divided ourselves and fractured your image. But in all our wanderings, you never cease to call us to the fullness of life. You gave us Jesus, Mary's child, the bread of life broken for the world. Jesus feeds us and feasts with us. Jesus heals us and suffers for us. Jesus is dying and rising, set us free from the poverty of sin, the famine of death, and the life of separation. Therefore, with all whom you have made, cherished and called, with all who hunger for your kingdom and will not rest until all your children are fed, with the broken saints and the redeemed sinners of all ages, for the wonder of ourselves and the wonder of your works, we gather as your people, and with one voice, we take up the song of your praise. We ask that your Holy Spirit will fall upon us and upon these gifts, that these fragile earthly things may be to us the body and blood of our sibling, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who gathers us today, who gathered friends together for thousands of years for a meal that tastes of freedom. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, Jesus took the bread. gave thanks, broke it, gave it to the disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you, for all the people, for forgiveness of their sins. Do this in the remembrance of me. Therefore, in our eating and drinking, we are filled with the life-giving presence of Christ. We proclaim him as a creation's host, transforming poverty into plenty in the reckless generosity of love. Inspire us with hope that one day death and greed will be no more, and people without number will come from east and west, north and south to share the kingdom meal. Come, triune God. Make of your many children one body in Christ. And come, siblings in Christ, share the feast of Jesus that you may become God's abundance for the world.
trusting in the mercy and compassion of God who is with us as mother and father. Let us pray as Jesus teaches us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the crime trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. communion. I hope that my body reminds you that no body is unwelcome from this table. Amen. All are welcome to celebrate communion with us. And as you have bread together, uh, know that the communion stations everywhere but right here is gluten free. And so if you need to be gluten full, come up this way, and if you have a body who would prefer to be gluten-free, find every other station. You are welcome in this place. Come, for all are welcome.
Oh God, our life, our strength, our food. We give you thanks for sustaining us with the body and blood of your beloved. By your Holy Spirit, enliven us to be the body of Christ at work in the world, that more and more we will give you praise and serve your earth and its many peoples through our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Receive this blessing. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Show love to everyone. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of the triune God be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Amen.